Greetings Saints, welcome to Chaplain Peter One on YouTube and check out my website eternalvaluesministries.com I've got a lot of uh, writing on there and other vi videos for you to see. Now we want to continue our uh, Bible study. We ended up here around Romans 8.28 after we talked about prayer and intercession that the Lord ever lives to make intercession uh, for us. And then it continues into verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I thought I would uh, use the Blue Letter Bible with its um, concordance. Right here we can see all the uh, concordance. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, so, I want to talk about today about predestination, foreknowledge, um, God choosing us, electing us to salvation. These are um, hard topics. Not for the Lord, but for uh, most of us. And there's been uh, great debates on this, about Calvinism and Arminianism, free will versus uh, the sovereignty of God. And um, I've watched some real good debates online here, and um, I've studied uh, some, somewhat about this. It's, and I've come to some conclusions that I'm going to share with you. First we have to understand that um, that if God gave all of us a free will and I'm speaking about the free will, the ability to choose for ourselves um, Jesus as Lord and Savior. In other words as many as believed on him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, the argument is that we are so far gone, so dead in trespasses and sins after the fall of Adam, that that's our state and condition, totally spiritually dead to God, dead in trespasses and sins, and um, that we cannot even believe the gospel. We can't even believe it. God has to move upon us by his Holy Spirit to draw us to Christ. Now, there, there's plenty of scriptures for this. Um, so, God does draw us, the Father draws us to his Son, and Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men um, onto me. And so, can we believe onto eternal life by our own uh, strength, or does God have to move upon us? This makes a big difference, because... If it is God that initiates the salvation, if you look at, um, let's see, let's go to um, let's go to Second uh, Thessalonians two thirteen. Here in the King James. Alright, he says, 
But we are bound to give thanks always, or always, to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So, the word chosen is, he, he's elected us before the foundation of the world. In other words, before creation was made, before he made Adam and Eve, before he made the planets and the stars, before creation. And he's chosen you to what? To salvation. Now, many may argue that, um, well, sure, you know, he, um, he's chosen you in the sense that he knew that you would believe. You know, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the uh, Word of God. I believe that's Romans uh, ten seventeen. But 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 here, here's the thing, uh, saints. That um, there's something here we have to uh, clear up, and we'll see it more when we get past Romans eight into Romans nine. We're gonna get more into this, but. We need to understand something, that um, if God never created us, if God never created mankind, then no one would go to heaven and no one would go to hell. Isn't that right? I mean, no uh, problems of life, nor good things of life, nor death. There would be no, no judgment no accountability because we don't exist and as I recall God never asked me if I wanted to exist or not how about you did God ever ask you do you want to exist would you like to be born into this world and have to uh, live in this world and go through many things of uh, sufferings and afflictions and then finally die and then give an account of your life to God and then heaven or hell. Now we know salvation cannot be by works. We understand that much. That's, that's clear that it is the gift of God. But I want to take this even further than just you and me believing the gospel, that that would be the gift of God, that we freely receive it by just believing it. I want to take it further, back to the foundation of the world, before creation, and that the gift actually starts back there, and that God has chosen us, God has elected some of us to salvation. Now right away comes to mind, okay, uh, he chose us to salvation. Now, what about all the rest of the people? He chose them to hell? Well, no. He just did not elect them. Will they end up in hell? Yes. In eternal damnation. Why? Because you must be born again. That's the gift. Eternal life. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ being imputed to your account. Romans chapter 4. So, uh, what, what is God doing here? He, God chose to make a creation, you and me. Just like you see it today, just like we are living today in life. He chose to make it. He did not ask me if I wanted to be born into it, uh, or what condition I would be born into, or what country or whether I'd be rich or poor or social status, any of those things. I just one day was born, just like you. This is God's call. This is God's call. He didn't have to ask me. He doesn't have to ask you. This is what it comes down to. And so here we are, and God didn't ask me. Now, um, a lot of people, I think, this upsets a lot of people. Because as I've witnessed to people, 
every once in a while, I, well, all the time you would get, um, if people reject Christ, there's an underlying anger there. But once in a while it would come out, um, you know, uh, you know, why, why, do, why did God, uh, you know, do this? Why don't he stop all the suffering? Why did he even, why did he make us? Why do I, why do I got to go to hell? Why do I, you know, and things like this. And, um, and with this underlying hatred, this rebellion towards God, this is in every one of us. Every one of us has our fist in God's face uh, from the time we're born. In sin did my mother conceive me, King David said. Another said in Jeremiah, in sin we were conceived. And so God, by his own choosing, according to his sovereign will, decided to make mankind. Uh, why? What's behind it? I uh, don't have that information. If you do, please let me know. <laughs> we, we can speculate, but uh, it's not good to really speculate. We want to know. And so what we have from the scripture, we can, we can take in, we can glean from the scriptures what God has done. So the Lord is telling us that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, remember, because he created us, some of us are going to be saved, and the rest of us, the rest of people who cannot believe, because God didn't choose them. God did not move upon them. They cannot be saved. And so they end up forever in a lake of fire. Well, that's unfair. Well, first of all, God didn't send them to the lake of fire. Um, because they didn't believe, he sent them there because they deserved it. Just like you and me would deserve to go there if we didn't trust Jesus either. Do you see that? So those who do not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will have to answer God for all their sins. No atonement, no forgiveness, no gift of God given to you, being justified by his blood, but the sentence of death and, and the second death uh, into the lake of fire for eternity. In one way, God sent them there because he didn't choose them, but I want you to understand that all of us deserve hell fire. This is according to God. Okay, you and me, we might not think that way. But according to God, all of us have sinned. All of us deserve the sentence of death and damnation for eternity upon us. But God in his grace, he chose some of us. See, that's the grace. It's not just, well, you say by grace through faith. And when you heard the gospel, you believed, you know, it's not of works. No, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. And so, why don't we uh, look at some, uh, some words here. And he says that um, in, verse, in verse 29, 829 of Romans, For whom he did foreknow. Let's look at the concordance. Uh, prognosko, and let's see, this is in the Greek, of course. Foreordain, know, know before, to, to have knowledge beforehand, to foreknow, of those whom God elected to salvation, to predestinate. So, um, and there's, there's more here we can look at. Here's the way it's used. Acts 26.5 
which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee, the Apostle Paul said. We saw Romans 8.29, Romans 11.2. 11, God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. All right. First um, Peter 1 20 who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world ordered ordained ordered uh, beforehand foreordained before the foundation of the world to be manifest in these last times for you second Peter 3 17 uh, ye therefore beloved seeing you know these things for beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Okay. So, um, let's go back. To foreknow, he knew beforehand. Oh, also, I want, I want to show you this here in Thayer's commentary. Something interesting he says here. He says, um, let's see, to have knowledge beforehand, to foreknow whom he, God, foreknew that they would love him. With reference to what follows, whom he foreknew to be fit to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So, Romans 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love him. So foreknew they would love him, and foreknew, in verse 29, that they would be conformed to the image of his son. Now, here's the question. Um, so God just looked out into the future, and um, he knew that you would believe that I would believe? Well, here's the problem. If we're dead in trespasses and sins and we don't have the strength to even believe, and God has to make us believe. In other words, when I received Christ, I had no idea that um, I was being drawn to Christ. I had no idea that uh, I was chosen before the foundation of the world. In fact, I was sitting in a park, I was 20 years old, about 42 years ago, and I was drinking a bottle of wine up in Chicago, and a man came up to me and told me the gospel. And the next day, he showed me Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. I didn't have any idea of this being chosen before the, being predestinated <laughs> and foreknowledge. <laughs> I just, it just came alive to me. The scripture, and I knew that Christ took my sins, and I was—I uh, got saved. I was born again, and it took years of uh, study uh, and uh, to try to, uh, you know, understand this. Listening to pastors preach and reading and and studying like we're doing right now, and you have to come to your own conclusion. Um, I'm not here to be uh, dogmatic about it or that you have to believe this way, but I, I, it really looks to me that uh, God did the whole thing, that he initiated this whole thing, because we were nowhere. We didn't even exist. And um, God brought this all about. And if God just looked out there in the future to see who would believe, uh, then he'd be at the mercy of us believing or not. For instance, um, the prophecy of, uh, let's, let's take a prophecy, let's take Judas. Um, my friend, you know, the Lord says in the prophecy that uh, he, he sold me out for 30 pieces of uh, silver. You can, you, can come, you can take any prophecy. He shall sit on the throne of David. Um, any prophecy you like, you can take it. For it to be fulfilled, let's, let's, let's go with Judas because this is a simple one to see. 
Judas had to betray Christ. Isn't that so? If Judas doesn't betray Christ, he doesn't get taken by the Sanhedrin and the Roman soldiers and go before Governor Pontius Pilate to be crucified. And if he's not crucified, if he didn't die and rise from the dead, then we're still dead in our sins, like Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15. And so, because Judas did what he did, now to say that, well, God just knew that he would do it. Or did God ordain it? Does God make prophecy come to happen because he moves this way in people's lives? He moves this way in their hearts and minds to accomplish his purposes? Or people just kind of do what they want and God and God sees it out there in the future, and that's how he uh, sets up his uh, his his uh, election and, and providences and and predestination and all this and foreknowledge. It's according to uh, I want to believe, I don't believe, I repent, I don't repent. Judas, you know, um, could Judas have changed his mind and not? Um, decided to sell out the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. So this is, this is what we're up against. And this is what we have to understand. Now remember where, where um, I started at the beginning. If God never created us, no suffering, no heaven, no hell, no glory, no damnation, no good times, no bad times, right? We don't exist. But God created us. It's obvious. We're here. And now we have to uh, come to an understanding that um, after the fall of Adam that mankind is so lost, so far gone, um, many people call it total depravity, in other words, dead and trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 3 uh, says, as it is written, there's none that is good. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek it after God. How many seek after God? Zero. You see, people can seek after all kinds of gods, but they're only going to find Muhammad or Buddha or uh, Christian science or philosophies or some other gods. That's all they're going to find. They cannot come to the knowledge of the true God unless God has chosen us and elected us and he moves upon us and he draws us to the sun. See, we got to be convicted first by his Holy Spirit. It's got to be that way. There is no other way. We must be convicted by his Holy Spirit. Without that conviction, there's no reason to come to God. And that conviction comes from God. That's John chapter uh, 16. You can look it up. And so, um, I believe that um, all these things is of God. And God put it all into motion. And God already called us before the world started to his glory. If you look at verse uh, 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate. Now, what's that predestinate? Just from looking at it in English, I get from it to, uh, it's a destination, but it's predetermined, to predetermine a destination. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, predetermine your destination, them he also called. How, you, how do you get called? By the gospel. And whom he called them he also justified. We're justified by his blood. And whom he's justified, them he also glorified in heaven with the Lord. And it's like it's in past tense, like it's already done. In God's mind, it's already finished. So whoever he predestinated is going to end up glorified with him. So 
Let's, let's look at the word predestinated in the Greek. See if we can't find out something else here. Okay. To predetermine, decide beforehand. In the New Testament of God, decreeing from eternity to foreordain a point beforehand. Let's see. In Thayer's Greek lexicon. New Testament of God, decreeing from eternity. Uh, what the... Oh, man, I don't know all these abbreviations here. With the addition of, okay, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, with a predestinated, foreordained, appointed beforehand, Romans 8, 29, want to obtain a thing, Ephesians 1, 11. We're going to have to look at Ephesians chapter 1. So, God decreeing from eternity um, the things that should follow. To, to predestinate, to, to a foreordain, to a point uh, beforehand. Acts 4.28 For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Let's, let's see that in its uh, entirety. Let's get the context here. Yes. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. That's a prophecy from Psalm chapter 2. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined, you know, were predestinated, determined beforehand, to be done. Now God had to move all these people of these nations ever since the, any of these things were prophesied to be done in this direction to accomplish this purpose. All these people here, uh, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the nations, the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel were gathered together. All this had to be Moved together to a single focus where they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ so that you and me can be saved. So, this cannot just be that God looked down in the time of a corridor, the corridor of time, and what, he had, what did he have to do? He had to wait till he got the desired result? How many times did he have to play this over and over? until he got the desired result. Sounds almost like evolution. How many times, uh, how many mutations do you need? How many billions of years do you need? How many times do you need things to, uh, you know, to, to be uh, uh, live and die before it gets just right so it can evolve to the next stage? It's not true. And so, God created. He created you and me. And even though it seems like you and me have a free will, we trusted Christ by our free will, behind the scene, something else was going on. Even today, um, I can't always tell when God does something in my life or moves, I'm, I might pray and I, and I watch and things start to happen, or maybe I didn't even pray, and God just directs my life in a certain way, certain things start to happen, and in the background it's the Holy Spirit working, and it's working in other people, in other situations, and it might involve other countries if you're in missions, and, th and all this is being done, and I'm not really aware of this. I can see the results as I look back on it. And so as I look back upon my salvation, yeah, I heard the gospel, and I believed. But what was going? But in the background, God was moving. And, and so, I, I always got to. I always keep coming back to this because this is what has 